Gary Knoll. On this special edition of our program, we're going to be exploring the politics, the pain, and the profits of cancer in the United States. My guest, one of America's leading consumer activist attorneys, Jim Turner. Jim Turner is well known for his reporting, his articles, his books, and his fights in the courtroom on behalf of the American consumer an associate for many years of Ralph Nader. Now Jim Turner has turned his sights and his guns and his influence to the war on cancer, talking and legislating on behalf of a more open, a more progressive way to fight this disease. We're talking with Jim Turner today in San Diego, California. We're looking at the work of Dr. Virginia Livingston Wheeler. Dr. Livingston Wheeler has for years been an advocate of non-toxic, non-invasive, therapies. We're going to explore more on our next program with Dr. Livingston, go in depth about her therapy. But today, we want to talk with Jim Turner about the fight that Dr. Livingston and other doctors of respect in this field have to encounter just to get their therapies before the American public in an objective and an open forum. You would assume that in the United States, we have freedom of choice. Well, that's true in most of our life. It is not true in the area of cancer. Many feel that there's a virtual monopoly, that outside of chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, there is no option, there is no alternative. Hence, there's no freedom of choice. Well, this can be substantial in its impact. It can mean life and death. What if you right now are suffering from a terminal condition, mesothelioma, pancreatic cancer, an operable brain tumor, oat cell cancer of the lung, and your physician has told you, sorry, there's nothing more we could do. Should you, at that point, stop your active pursuit of cures, or should you simply say, maybe there's an alternative? If you go to the American Cancer Society and you ask about Dr. Virginia Livingston Wheeler, they'll say her therapy is on their unproven methods of cancer management list. Well, they won't say that it's a blacklist, but others will tell you it's used as a blacklist, and hence, you would all probably not want to see Dr. Livingston. After all, you wouldn't want to go into the hands of someone that is not within the heart of established medicine. And yet there are numerous scientists, numerous doctors of respect who support Dr. Livingston's work. You're going to hear from them during this special. Now to Jim Turner and his views on the work of Dr. Virginia Livingston Wheeler and the politics to try to suppress that work. Jim, do you feel that there is room for alternative or complementary medical practices in America now? Absolutely. Uh, there's not only room for it, there's need for it. We have a situation where uh, we have uh, an enormously costly health care system. It's not at all clear that the uh, benefits of that system uh, in any way approach the costs. And uh, at the same time, we have many, many new efforts in virtually every area of uh, health maintenance, health improvement, and disease prevention, and disease cure, which are being, efforts are being made to create them. And uh, at this point, there's a tremendous clash going on between the two points of view. Jim, it uh, may seem pretentious to many people to, to take it upon oneself to be the judge and juror of a whole area of research. And yet the American Cancer Society has deemed itself the authority to judge what is right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable, within cancer research. It has embodied all of its thoughts and prejudices in a book called The Unproven Methods of Cancer Management. It's tantamount in many people's feelings to a blacklist. First, what's your feeling about an organization, a private organization, having such a list with the power to decide future? After all, if you're on that list, funding dries up, recognition dries up. Uh, you're looked upon in a very uh, pejorative way. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, I think that um, the listing, as the Cancer Society has done it, has been uh, terribly misused. Uh, we have letters from the Cancer Society and information from the Cancer Society, which they purvey internally saying that that list of unproven methods does not mean that it's a blacklist and does not mean that it's supposed to be something used against the individual people who are listed on it. 
However, when it becomes public and begins to be used by others and some members of the Cancer Society apparently not knowing its purpose, it does get used as a blacklist. And in fact, we would like to have them be much more explicit in the Livingston uh, Wheeler uh, section of that list and, perhaps, and indeed for all of the lists that uh, these are merely guiding principles. These are statements that say what is done here has not been proven in accordance with the American Cancer Society's principles. I have no objection to that concept. What I object to is the notion that goes along with that concept when it's being used that because something is not proven according to the American Cancer Society's standards, it is therefore quackery or unacceptable or wrong. That's an improper use of that list and it's improper thinking by the Cancer Society and anyone else who uses it. In but our in individual conversations, the Cancer Society denies that they're used as a blacklist. We'd like them to purvey that idea more. Isn't there a double standard though? I mean, they're not criticizing surgery and the failures within chemotherapy and radiation and the limitations, yet they take it upon themselves to criticize and condemn alternatives that are non-invasive. Isn't it also tantamount to a person being accused of shoplifting when they've never even been in the store? Well, let's focus specifically on the, on the Livingston Wheeler situation. Um, and, uh, and talk about it from the standpoint that you've, you've questioned. Um, uh, Dr. Livingston's uh, work uh, is, is written about in a rather shoddy way uh, in the statement that's presented about her. And uh, we would like to see the Cancer Society clean that shoddiness up. And there, so far, there is indications that they would do that. But what's important to understand about her listing is that it deals only with one very narrow aspect of her program. There's all, it's one very narrow aspect of the testing and diagnostic part of what she does. What we're asking the Cancer Society to do, and, and, and we'll have some discussions with them about, hope that they will do, is to clarify several things. One, that unproven does not mean disproven. Two, that they are not talking about the entire program of the Livingston Clinic, but only one narrow aspect of it. And three, that Dr. Livingston is reputable by their standards with regard to having not only a medical degree, but having had a long history of research experience, having a significant enough uh, effect in positive ways to have serious researchers want to look at her work. That the point that we're trying to get at with the Cancer Society is that as far as, if they want to be clear and accurate about what they're saying and want to create a list and be clear about what their standards are, we don't object to that. What we do object to, to however, are two things. One is the tone of misrepresentation that accompanies the facts that they present. They, the, the facts are relatively accurate, but it's filled in with all of this rhetoric that, that misleads people who are looking at it. And secondly, we want them to be clear that they are one voluntary organization offering assistance to cancer patients and that their point of view is only as good as whatever their basic ideas are. And that other people have every bit as much right to be able to present alternatives to what the Cancer Society is saying as the Cancer Society has to present its point of view. And we hope that we will be able to move or persuade the Cancer Society to move in that direction with Livingston Wheeler's case and then hopefully, as an example, for all the cases on that list. If we can do that, clarify the facts that they say they are presenting, and then make it be clear that this is one guidance, this is one group, this is as if one group of people reviewing movies, perhaps. I mean, you read the New York Times for movie review, maybe you read the Daily News, read something else. You take your point of view for the movie review from where you get it. Cancer Society is one point of view. If that could be established, we might be able to undercut the blacklist nature of that, of that list. Now, I, I mentioned this, oh, this is only one fact in this whole big complementary medicine area, uh, and we just happen to be talking about that. Part of what's confusing to me and many others, I would imagine, is that if you take it upon yourself to judge cancer research and cancer treatment, and you have a book that says these are all unproven methods, and you list, of course, all the leading advocates of alternative therapy, but you don't include in there surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and what is experimental within it and the fact that most of it is experimental because they're not getting cures with the major cancers, isn't there a double standard here? If you're going to be a judge 
or a movie critic of the cancer community, shouldn't you judge everything equally and not be biased to keep part of it separate, that which you support? Just makes sense. Does it make sense to you? Well, I think absolutely the standards that are applied to get uh, the unproven list developed should be applied not only, they, they should be applied to the three major systems that are us utilized in the mainstream of cancer treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, all three of which have extremely serious problems. Again, I would suggest that they break it down in the, uh, in the specific way they do with the complementary people break it down into uh, specific chemotherapy approaches. There are some chemothera uh, chemotherapy approaches used uh, even by many of the complementary alternative people which are less invasive and less dangerous. Uh, they may very well be looked at and be seen to be as proven to be effective. I believe also it's very, very important to list in the chemotherapy area, the radiation area, and in the, um, and in the surgery area, those approaches which have been shown to be ineffective. There are many of them out there, now not used as much as they used to be, which are not as effective or even ineffective. But people have fallen into the use of them because they become a pattern, and the Cancer Society does not look at that. Now, I, I think a, a possible approach might be to create a, an opportunity to look at these alternative, that these mainstream systems in a way uh, that is similar to the Cancer Society approach, but by other individuals. There are people out there not part of the uh, American Cancer Society system who are very, very critical of the approach of the Cancer Society, but are mainstream establishment people. They yes. may be able to criticize some of these. All right. Jim, you've been a consumer advocate lawyer for several decades now. You've been affiliated with Ralph Nader. And You've been a champion of the uh, common person's cause, helping act as a barrier between complete uh, manipulation on the part of those individuals within industry that are unscrupulous and an innocent public. If you were heading this whole movement, how would you redirect the war on cancer? Well, the, uh, the uh, first issue is that uh, the system right now is being driven by money. It's being driven by cost. Uh, it is not possible to move a cancer therapy uh, alternative into the mainstream under the current system without the expenditure of enormous amounts of money. If you don't expend that kind of money, you are not considered to be a, an effective mainstream system. If you do expend that kind of money, you almost invariably are considered to be effective. So the result now is that whether or not you are accepted into the system is more a measure of how much money you expend on becoming accepted, not on how effective your actual work is. The result of that is that only those people who have enormous amounts of money, and those generally mean large corporations, are able to get into the, into the system that people utilize. The secondary downstream result is if you get trapped inside the cancer situation, you must expend as a patient enormous amounts of money just to be able to receive the treatments that are considered to be the proper mainstream, quote, effective treatments. Once you are in that kind of a position, you end up being caught inside the, either the Medicare Medicaid system or the insurance system so that you have this enormous money framework shaping how much and what kind of therapy a person gets when they receive cancer. I would suggest, it seems to me, that the biggest approach that we need to take from a legislative and administrative point of view is to, in an old principle that we use in looking at consumer advocacy, is follow the dollars. Where are the dollars going and where are they coming from? And then start to pull the situation apart. Inside the Medicare system, for example, there is the so-called uh, uh, alternative, uh, experimental alternative. You can't get paid for experimental treatments, but you are allowed to use them and you are, are allowed to actually uh, treat people with the experimental systems and remain inside the so-called Medicare system. Uh, what I would suggest is that some very serious undertaking be made to look at that experimental window and see what kinds of things are going on there and begin to start being able to generate funds into that system to help those alternatives actually begin to be utilized but and be Jim, paid for. Jim, I see a double standard here because people receiving arthritic care 
with uh, hormone drugs are routinely reimbursed by their, without any question, uh, by their insurance carriers through their rheumatologist. That's experimental. At MD Anderson, at Sloan Kettering, at Roswell Park, these are major respected cancer institutions. They're constantly using new research models that have not been proven. Patients are paid, uh, reimbursed. So you, you seem to have a double standard existing. If you're a major establishment medical organization or hospital and your physician is using traditional or allopathic conservative medical care, even if it doesn't work, even if it is experimental, they're reimbursed. But the moment something is labeled alternative or new age or complementary, it's not. Well, the, this, the double standard is even more subtle than that. Um, I uh, suspect, I don't know each of the details on each of the hospitals that you named, but uh, I suspect that if I were to go inside and look at the regulations, I would find that, uh, technically speaking, by accounting principles, the so-called uh, experimental aspect of the program is not paid for. That is true in a number of instances. But there are many ancillary services that are paid for in those institutions. Uh, physical examinations, uh, even, uh, even the uh, housing of the individual in the hospital and so forth. They will get paid into that institution for those kinds of work, even though the experimental is not reimbursed for. On the other hand, a clinic like Dr. Livingston's clinic, because she is listed as experimental, has nothing paid for. The double standard is so subtle that, uh, or maybe it's crude once you look at it, but subtle when you look at the larger picture, it is, it is, is such that if Dr. Livingston does a physical on a patient, she will not be reimbursed by Medicare. On the other hand, uh, and, and if she sends out laboratory information, uh, if she does laboratory information in her laboratory she, as part of that physical, she will not be reimbursed. On the other hand, if she sends that same data out to a laboratory across town, which does that work and then sends it back, the laboratory across town will be reimbursed for exactly the same work. Why? This is a double standard. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, a vicious, uh, discriminatory double standard. Now, what I was trying to do in response to your question was just to refine slightly the nature of the double standard. Um, and it's a very, the, the, the main issue that emerges is that if you uh, are willing to sit down and, and take a, a fight and pull this thing out like a strand from a ball of string, ultimately somewhere down the road, the individual doctor who has taken on that fight will ultimately probably be reimbursed. The problem is all the effort that goes into that takes effort away from the patients that are being dealt with. Most doctors aren't interested in fighting legal battles. Most doctors aren't interested in being caught in an administrative process. They want to help patients. And here are these people out here doing these relatively inexpensive, uh, relatively um, uh, in, uninvasive therapies, being asked to carry an enormous administrative burden to fight the system so that they won't be discriminated against in the kinds of ways that I've suggested. I would say from, I, I started out talking legislatively, but administratively I believe there needs to be a serious investigation into this kind of approach so that these kinds of discriminations don't exist. The major problem is that uh, the marketplace is being blocked from accepting systems that are less expensive, less invasive, and in many instances at least as effective as what people are paying large amounts of money for and getting in invasive therapy for. We're talking in the cancer area. Most of the physicians I've interviewed um, dealing with alternative cancer therapies or complementary medicine are rather self-effacing, shy, they're wanting to spend their time helping their patients. They're not actively engaging in any battle, not voluntarily. And yet Dr. Livingston is cut from a different cloth. She has actively taken on her rights to see that the government or any agency doesn't uh, discriminate against her. Now that's an enormous battle. It's costly, it's time consuming, it's emotionally draining. And yet she's done it. Would you give us some background on that fight? Well, Dr. Livingston has been uh, a remarkable battler all along, and she has uh, tremendous loyalty from her patients and uh, tremendous loyalty uh, from uh, the people that she has trained to do what she's doing. And also, uh, interestingly enough, she has uh, quite a wide uh, support among uh, doctors in the medical community who are actually treating patients. 
Uh, for example, uh, over 75% of her patients are people who are diagnosed by and referred by other physicians who then return back to their physicians for their basic uh, treatment and for measuring their progress. So that Dr. Livingston is almost a support uh, person in the treatment of a patient with other doctors. Inci also, interestingly enough, uh, over half of her patients are, um, are uh, doctors themselves, doctors or nurses or other healthcare people. Uh, this whole complex uh, was uh, attacked in a way by uh, Medicare when they decided to exclude her from the Medicare program, uh, making what I consider to be wild charges about her incompetence and so forth, uh, even though she explicitly did not bill Medicare for her fees. She did not bill Medicare and her patients were instructed not to bill Medicare. Uh, unfortunately, uh, from a technical point of view, uh, during uh, one quarter of one year, about $570 worth of uh, uh, Medicare bills were paid to one of her patients uh, by accident, in a sense. Uh, the reviewers did not catch that they weren't supposed to be paid, but a patient did supply and so forth. This, plus some other uh, uh, similar activities, a total of about $500, ended up with the government making a very, very large case, a federal case, so to speak, out of her situation. They attacked her and made uh, wild charges in the attack. In fact, they relied on some newspaper interviews as evidence in the case, a completely unreasonable approach, and uh, tried uh, very vigorously and inappropriately to essentially drive her out of business. There were people sent down to interview her and, uh, and uh, in my view, uh, were not accurate in uh, their reporting of what went on and so forth. Uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Livingston felt that this was an unfair and unreasonable way to deal with things. And even though it did not mean anything to her in terms of income because she was not billing Medicare, she did, in fact, uh, resist the effort to expel her from Medicare. And ultimately, the administrative law judge who heard the case ordered that she be returned to Medicare and essentially uh, his finding was such that uh, he felt that the government had not been fair to Dr. Livingston. Now for her to carry on this battle uh, was very costly and uh, it was quite um, uh, trying for her. It was about two years of administrative activity and being caught up in the, uh, in the uh, federal system this way uh, is uh, very trying. Anyone who's had a tax audit would know what it's like, uh, but think of a tax audit that went on for two to two and a half years. Uh, with a systematic reviewing of every aspect of her activities. Uh, the end result of all of this was that she was able to vindicate her own approach, not that it was proven, not that it was a cancer cure, but that what she was doing was not unacceptable medicine. In fact, the government's own witnesses were unable, in fact, testified that they would not say that it was substandard medicine. Uh, what they did say was that it was experimental, and as experimental, that Medicare should not reimburse it. But since she hadn't been asking for reimbursement, the judge essentially found that she had not done anything to warrant her being expelled from the program. Uh, the importance of this from my point of view uh, uh, as an argument uh, is that uh, not expelling her from the program leaves it open to make the argument that she should receive reimbursement for ancillary services that are not related to her treatment, which are reimbursed in hospitals all over America. I'd like to thank you, Jim Turner, for sharing this information with us today. Well, this is just part of the story. There's only so much we can cover in any limited television program. I'm Gary Knoll, talking on location from San Diego. Thank you for watching.